Hello, I'm Dr. Shilpa Gupta. I'm a genital urinary oncologist at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and leader for the Bladder Cancer Program. It is my great privilege to sit with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Petros Grievous, to discuss some of the exciting abstract from GEO ASCO 2021. Thank you, Silpa. It's a pleasure to discuss with you this exciting data from ASCO GU 2021. I'm Petrus Grivas. I'm a medical oncologist at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. I'm an associate professor and clinical director of the Gentle Urinary Cancers Program at the University of Washington and associate member of the Fred Hudson Cancer Research Center. Thanks again for being available to discuss today. That's great. Uh, we'll discuss some of the key abstracts from the metastatic urothelial cancer setting, Petros, and um, as you know, they presented the uh, primary results of EV301, which is the landmark study of enfortimabidontin um, versus chemotherapy in patients with previously treated uh, locally advanced or metastatic urothelial cancer. And this publication also came out simultaneously in the NEJM uh, yesterday. So what are your thoughts from uh, seeing this uh, long-term follow-up data? Silpa, this is a great point, and I agree with you that the EV301 trial is one of the major highlights of the ASCO GU 2021 meeting. Uh, there was a fantastic and practice-changing data, in my opinion, presented by Professor Powell's and uh, colleagues. So EV301 was a randomized phase three trial of a form of a dotin, an antibody drug conjugated against nectin-4, conjugated with a MMAE toxin or payload, uh, compared to uh, physician choice chemotherapy, taxane single agent in US or Vinflin in Europe. And the primary point uh, was overall survival. These are patients who had prior treatment with uh, chemotherapy, platinum-based chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitor, uh, and about 13, 1-3% had uh, more than uh, three, lines, three or more uh, uh, prior lines of therapy. 87% had uh, two prior lines of therapy, so predicted patients. Overall survival was met uh, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.70, a favoring in form of a dotting, and also a significant progression of survival benefit of, of hazard ratio 0 0.61, uh, suggesting that the form of a dotting is now the standard of care, uh, in my opinion, in the third line space uh, in patients with previously treated uh, advanced urothelial cancer. Uh, the design of the study was very uh, reasonable. Uh, the point was clearly met, and uh, uh, there is definitely, I think, a practice informing that may lead, in my opinion, in regulatory full approval of this agent. Um, there is definitely importance to highlight the potential side effects with every therapy, including a form of a dotting, and uh, uh, Dr. Sifke Radke did a nice job uh, in the discussion, um, uh, underlining some uh, uh, messages regarding uh, potential management and diagnosis of adverse events, uh, for example, um, peripheral neuropathy, skin rash, skin changes, hyperglycemia, fatigue, anorexia and others, uh, but I think with best supportive care and some of those holds or uh, adjustments, uh, definitely if of dotin is a very, very important option and standard of care now uh, in this particular setting. And I think antibody drug conjugates in general uh, are very promising. In addition to that, there is a, a trial in progress. We had the TROPIC-04 trial with Sacitus-Mokovitikan and antibody drug conjugate against uh, TROP2 uh, with also promising results. So I think overall the antibody drug conjugates are changing uh, the landscape in advanced urothelial cancer. And in your experience, Petros, patients who prior had uh, cisplatin or carboplatin-based chemotherapy may be already struggling with peripheral neuropathy. What are your some of the strategies you use in your current practice to try to leverage the maximum benefit from enfortimabidontin while not making the neuropathy worse? Silva, this is a great question, and you know we all have patients, you know, who are you know uh, in, in a senior age of life, and also have prior platinum-based chemotherapy. So neuropathy can be an issue. Um, I, I think that it's important to recognize that early and uh, try to be very detailed in a physical exam, as well as the history when you discuss with a patient, so to have a better understanding of the uh, grade, the uh, uh, level of neuropathy. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, I would say, an art of medicine because, uh, in my opinion, it's, it's reasonable to consider uh, holding a dose or reducing the dose at some point, you know, uh, with a, early on when you see uh, signs of worsening neuropathy, as, you know, especially if you go to grade two, uh, which can be really uh, devastating. At the same time, um, you know, we, we know from the clinical trials that if you reduce too early, especially in the first cycle, you may lose some response. So I think it's a balance between efficacy and toxicity. And, uh, you know, the medications we use for neuropathy are not working that well. So I think uh, it comes down to uh, probably those adjustments, you know, changes, you know, holding the dose, uh, reducing the dose or increasing the interval 
between dosing to try to get the patients through and maximize the ratio between benefit and risk. Great. Uh, and moving on to the next uh, abstract, which was the EV201 cohort 2, and Fortimabidontin again in CISPAD in ineligible patients with locally advanced or metastatic urothelial cancer who received prior immunotherapy, but not chemotherapy. This was an interesting cohort of patients who only had prior immunotherapy. And um, as you know, Dr. Uh, Ballard presented these uh, results, around 90% uh, patients were treated and EV again showed remarkable uh, response rates of over 50% and overall survival. Uh, this was a single arm um, cohort and uh, overall survival of around 14.7 months. I uh, would love to get your insights on this cohort. I agree, Silva. This is uh, very, very exciting. The data by Dr. Ballar and colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Yu and others are really, really uh, informative here. This is a cohort of 89 patients, as you mentioned, who got immune checkpoint inhibitor in the frontline setting. They did not get plant-based chemotherapy, and they got in form of a dot in antibody drug conjugate against nectin 4 in the second line. And the overall response rate is impressive, 52%, uh, with, uh, if I recall correctly, 20% complete response rate. Uh, this is very exciting, uh, for sure, a huge efficacy signal in the second line space in patients who never got uh, chemotherapy for advanced disease. Uh, I think uh, uh, the big question in my mind is whether this data will result or not in a regulatory approval of Enfortimob in this particular post-IO setting in patients who never got chemo. Um, you know, the, the plus, the, the, the supporting uh, um, you know, information is the impressive efficacy. At the same time, is a single arm study, uh, not randomized. The uh, sample size is 89 patients, so uh, relatively on the smaller side. Um, so I think we don't have a randomization compared to chemotherapy that sometimes can be used in the second line. So I think it's, in my opinion, it's interesting. Uh, I personally would like to have an option for the patients, especially those who cannot get uh, platinum-based chemotherapy. So I think it's compelling. Uh, at the same time, going back to the question we discussed before, you know, we talk about neuropathy. Another thing that I, you know, I want to add to my to my previous comment was sometimes, especially with a sensory neuropathy, as we see with Enfortumab, we may add uh, agents like gabapentin or pregabalin or uh, duloxetine that sometimes can help, especially with a sensory component, uh, which, you know, can, can be improved. Uh, and uh, that's another uh, um, thing we can do with the neuropathy in those patients. Uh, but I think an, an extra point is to keep a close eye on the metabolic panels of those patients and check the glucose levels because about 10% can get hyperglycemia and half of them can be severe. So I think with proper management of the, and diagnosis of uh, adverse events, I think it's important to have you know, this age available even in that setting. And uh, I think the data overall, uh, despite the caveats we discussed with uh, single arm, smaller size of cohort, it's, it's very, very exciting. And congratulations to the authors. Yeah, and I would like to uh, pick your brain on, you know, right now the current standard is at least our preference is to use carboplatin-based regimens in these patients, followed by uh, available maintenance based on the work you did on the Javelin Bladder 100 trial. And um, this data does look uh, good with the caveats of single arm trial. And um, I think this almost begs another study to see whether we can get rid of the platinum altogether, or is the sequential use of immunotherapy uh, with the platinum conferring the overall survival advantage as shown by you uh, and colleagues, or the EV302 study looking at EV and Pembro versus first-line platinum-based chemotherapy. So uh, the landscape is kind of all over the place and rapidly evolving. Would love to get your thoughts. Silpa, I agree with you. This is uh, exciting to see this data coming out in urothelial cancer. You know, until five years ago, we, we wouldn't have this discussion because no matter what's happening, but now we have a plethora of data coming out. So my personal bias, and obviously, you know, I'm involved uh, in the Javelin Better 100 trial, and the bias I have in clinical practice is for patients who can't tolerate platinum-based chemotherapy. Uh, that's my to-go first-line option. Uh, I prefer cisplatin over carboplatin in fit patients. If I cannot give cisplatin uh, because of performance status or neuropathy or you know, um, uh, kidney function or significant hearing loss in some patients or um, um, some heart failure in some patients, I may use carboplatin gemcitabine and then I use switch metanas avelumab uh, after gemcis or gemcarbo for those with response or stable disease uh, based on the Javelin Bladder 100 trial because uh, uh, we have not compared that regimen to immunotherapy 
uh, alone or amino acid followed by chemo. But I think we have the, I would say, the, the data set with the longest overall survival ever seen in advanced urothelial cancer. So I prefer to go to that approach, plant-based chemo followed by available maintenance in those with response to stable disease. I reserve checkpoint inhibitor alone for patients who are not fit for any platinum, cis and carb one fit. And you have done some work uh, uh, with Dr. Roger Berg, myself, and others trying to define this platinum unfit population. And I think it is an important question, how you define those patients. But those patients who cannot get any chemo um, can get sequot inhibitor. We published a follow-up from the Kinot 52 trial looking at those senior patients with poor performance status who may benefit from checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, those patients, you know, may be those who may get, you know, second line and fortumab after checkpoint inhibitor. The question is how common is this population? And I think it's, uh, you know, maybe around 10% in academic practice, maybe about 20% in, in community practice. Uh, but we also have some patients who refuse chemo to begin with. So that may be added in that population. These are certainly very exciting times and a good problem to have, to have all these uh, discussions about the uh, evolving landscape. Um, the next abstract that uh, we'll discuss is the Titan TCC abstract presented by uh, Dr. Mark Oliver Grimm, which is the tailored immunotherapy approach with nivolumab in advanced translational cell carcinoma. This was uh, Quite an intriguing abstract, in my opinion, uh, using a boost ipinevo approach uh, after nivolumab treatment. Would love to get your insights on this. Thank you, Silpa. Very important study by Dr. Grimm and colleagues in Germany, the Titan study. We saw a similar uh, trial design in kidney cancer presented by Dr. Suarez, I think, at a previous ESMO meeting. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because the approach here is kind of an escalated therapy approach. You start with NIVO alone in patients who do not achieve, uh, you know, uh, response. You might escalate, but even in patients who, you know, um, uh, you know, have stable disease, uh, you may uh, try to add EP uh, in order to uh, see if you can achieve higher response rates. So uh, it's interesting approach, and you know, it reminds me of trials like Pedigree in kidney cancer by Dr. Zhang and others. So I, overall, I think it's important data. Um, to me, it's difficult to interpret this data and how they translate in clinical practice. Um, I think it's uh, it's hypothesis generating. Uh, we saw some higher response rates uh, in patients who uh, had stable disease. For example, with nivalone, you add EP, you convert some patients, if a small proportion of patients from stable disease to response. And also you try to solve some patients with progressive disease by adding the EP to NIVO. However, I think this is hypothesis generating. Uh, I do not think this is practice changing. Uh, and I think it uh, definitely reinforces the interest uh, in the Checkmate, uh, two, uh, the Checkmate 901 trial in the frontline setting for the audience to remind this is EP NIVO versus uh, uh, GEMSYS or GEMCARBO uh, in frontline setting. Uh, and, and there is also randomization of GEMSYS NIVO versus GEMSYS uh, again, this is Checkmate 901 in the frontline space, and I have to see what this trial shows. I agree, Petros. This is a hypothesis generating and uh, will help design future studies. But I think the, the way the paradigm is looking now is to incorporate chemo and or EV at some point to get the maximum leverage from these uh, frontline therapies. Um, and lastly, we have the Tropic 04 uh, study, uh, which... Uh, you uh, presented, and uh, the floor is yours to discuss this abstract. Thank you, Silpa. Uh, I will uh, uh, definitely express my enthusiasm about this agent, such to smoke govitican, as I mentioned before, antibody drug conjugate against TROP2, uh, linked conjugated with a SN38, which is a metabolite of irinotecan, a top one inhibitor. Uh, the TROPHY user one trial, phase two trial, single agent, uh, cohort to one, showed overall response rate of 27%. Uh, in patients with multiple prior lines of therapy, uh, showing that this uh, uh, antibody drug conjugate is active in this disease and I think has significant potential, in my opinion, for regulatory approval in uh, you know, serving an unmet need uh, in patients with multiple prior therapies. Uh, we want to have options for, for our patients. It has a different toxicity profile within Fortumab, so I can see both being used in those patients and, you know, the uh, sequence will be defined down the road and will be influenced by level of evidence with uh, efficacy data, by um, toxicity profile data, so on and so forth. But I think it's good to have options in, for our patients overall uh, as, as a principle. Um, based on these promising results of the cohort one of the Trophy User One trial, 
with single agent uh, such as Gubitikan, uh, we uh, went ahead and designed a phase three trial, confirmatory trial, which is actually very similar to the EV301, is comparing such as Gubitikan, uh, this antibody drug conjugate against ROP2, uh, versus uh, single agent taxane in US or within in Europe. Uh, this phase three trial called Tropics uh, 04, and we're very excited to launch it and uh, we're hopeful that we're gonna crew um, uh, quite well and fast you know, in US and Europe and many sites so we can generate data, uh, phase three level data with overall survival being the primary endpoint uh, with that study. So we want to make sure uh, our colleagues are aware of the study and thank you for highlighting. Yeah, and we uh, we are in the process of opening this trial at the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, remind me, Dr. Grievous, this does allow prior EV use, right, in the salvage setting? You're correct. Yeah, this does uh, allow uh, prior in form of a uh, It allows, you know, uh, prior therapy, so uh, including EV, platinum-based chemo, checkpoint inhibitor, EV. Uh, so there is no limitation in the number of prior therapies. So we're very excited about this trial. Topic zero four. Yeah, I think this, uh, like you pointed out, the good thing about these two antibody drug conjugates is that they don't have overlapping toxicities. So even if patients have had EV, they could go on this and vice versa. So this is really exciting. And this this abstract, uh, congratulations on uh, leading this study. Thank you, Silva. It's always a pleasure to discuss with you and exchange ideas. Uh, great meeting. Thank you, Dr. Grievous. That was really an exciting and enlightening discussion. And this GU ASCO has been uh, really a very um, great meeting with a lot of uh, practice changing abstracts and uh, progress discussions. Thank you.